Hello again and good evening. So feel free to get comfortable. I just want to start by saying welcome to all of you and to thank you all very much for being here this evening. It's absolutely wonderful to have you visiting PBS again. I would like to start by thanking a few people who are here. If you are a current PBS parent and you're here helping host tonight and share your wonderful stories, could you just raise your hand and let's give them a warm round of applause. We have a we have a great group of PBS parents who are very engaged in our admissions process and we're so thankful you're here, so thank you so much. And if you're a staff member or faculty colleague, could you just raise your hand too so we can thank you? Thank you for a great evening. In particular, in the back we have Michelle, Mita, and Michael who are with me on our advancement team. They're joined by Christina, who is here somewhere, or has been here somewhere, and they're the group that's helped plan this evening. So thank you so much, Mita and the team, for making this event happen. I would say that this gathering is actually quite typical for PBS. It's a parent engagement opportunity when we have a chance to come together and talk about the school. Our parents are talkative, and they love to talk about this wonderful school. And if you join this community, my team and I will be absolutely laser focused on your children having the best possible learning experience every single day. Now, to achieve that promise, we are constantly working on ways to grow and to strengthen our school. This ensures that we can deliver our mission and core values, which is our number one priority. Tonight, I'd like to offer you some thoughts and insights into some of our current work, some of the things we're do doing currently, and to give you a little bit of a perspective about what makes us tick as a school. Then we'll have time for your questions, and I promise that we'll reach our goal of finishing by 7 o'clock. So what is it that makes PBS distinctive? What makes this school so special? These are really important questions. After all, you're looking at schools, and you want the best possible learning environment for your children. I want to be very clear with you so that you can get a clear and authentic picture about PBS. I think there are three things in particular that make us distinctive. First, we have rigorous academics, rigorous academics that challenge our students, balanced with an outstanding emotional intelligence program. We say it this way, that you can have it both ways. Top-notch academics balanced with outstanding emotional intelligence. Second thing that makes this school very special is that all of our students are known and loved by their teachers. That student and teacher bond at PBS is very special and sacred. Third, I would say that PBS offers a strong and warm sense of community. Community is so awesome here. I know that you're looking for this. I was looking for it eight years ago. I found it, and I think you found it too right here at PBS. So these three things, I think, make PBS very special. And I think there are three ingredients, three elements, that come together to make these three things happen. The first is a strong school and home partnership. The second is high caliber teaching. And the third is our excellent program. I'd like to say a few words about each because they're so important to our success. So first, a few words about school home partnership. That's why we're here. Our parents are engaged. They support our initiatives. They're passionate about their children's education. We support them through family education, really wanting to share the why behind our curriculum as much as the what. This month, we had a family education series on emotional intelligence. The first session was led by Professor Mark Brackett. He's the director of the Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence. This was his fourth visit to PBS, and we're working towards a goal of establishing a partnership with Yale to make PBS something like the center for Yale's Emotional Intelligence Center here in the Bay Area or even the West Coast. This year, we added a new position to the school called Director of Emotional Intelligence. 
Our own Dr. Sarah Reha, who's new this year to this very new position, led that second session in the series. Her role, I think, is unique among independent schools. I've not seen a position like this at another school. And we're proud as a school to lead the way on this initiative. In March, we're hosting a parent ed session on digital citizenship. That's on everybody's mind, whether you have a three-year-old or a 30-year-old. The first session in this series will be led by Dana Bloom of Common Sense Media. I think you've heard of them. I'm on their Bay Area Council, adding my educator's perspective to that group. The second session will be led by Lane Young, who's here tonight. He is our own Director of Educational Technology. This is also a new position at PBS this year, trying to boost our work in digital citizenship and ed tech. I also think that PBS parents vote with their feet. Here's some stats. How many parents visited math classes in a one week period during our math days? 144. Parents who attended eight grade level coffees in the fall? 280. Individual new family meetings with me. I meet with all of our new families every fall, 100% attendance. Our annual benefit last year was the best attendance in history with parents excited to attend our back to the 80s theme, not bad. We set a new record, not just for attendance, but raising funds for financial aid so that we can build the intentional community that we want at PBS. Also last year, our annual fund hit 100% parent participation for the very first time in the school's history. That was very exciting. And we also raised the highest dollars in the school's history. That allows us to have strong faculty compensation and to invest and resource in our program and our teachers. And finally, here's the last number. The number of parents who volunteer for classes and field trips. Guess what the number is? Countless. Literally, it's too many to count. And we like that because that's a way to build the school home partnership. But parents are also voting with clicks, with their fingers on the computer. What I mean here is that parents and other family members, they can't always be present on campus. We don't expect that. So in the last year to 18 months, we've provided some new opportunities. So here's some more data points. Total video watch time since the start of school. Get this, 16,000 498 minutes. That's 27 videos and almost 16,500 minutes watched by our families and grandparents. How many views of our public blog posts have we seen since August? 3,093. How many views of the class blogs written by our teachers that parents can take a look at? 12,937. Now here's one that's very important. How many parents and grandparents who could not attend the holiday concert in December, but could watch it online? 390 views live, and up to 651 views to date today. Now here's a couple great stories. One grandfather to one of our kindergartners, he was here in person, but his son, the father, was on an airplane coming back from Asia and was watching the holiday concert live streamed on his computer. The grandfather told me how special it was that his son could see his own son in the holiday concert live, even though he couldn't be here. And then another lovely story. One of um, our grandparents died during the holiday season, and her daughter, one of our PBS parents, told me that it was very special to the grandmother to watch her grandchildren in videos doing the holiday concerts before she died. That's why we want parents engaged in our community. So during this admission process, you're probably wondering, asking yourselves, so what is PBS actually looking for in the families who come to the school? Here's a brief answer. We want families to partner with us. We want families who want a strong sense of community. And we want families who recognize that there are twists and turns in the learning experience along the way. We want to listen to you. 
so we can partner for your kids, and we want you to listen to us. That's what we mean by school-home partnership. So secondly, the second ingredient, high-caliber teachers. This is an enormously key ingredient to our success. These are those people who really learn to know and love each of their students. They are also experts at early childhood and elementary education. So in December, we conducted our annual student survey. This is what those students said about their teachers. First statement, my home classroom teacher knows me well. 91% of our students said strongly agree or agree. My home classroom teacher cares about me. 97%. My home classroom teacher wants me to succeed and do well in school. 97%. And then this statement, I know what is expected of me in my classroom. 93% of our students said always or usually. In our anonymous surveys over three years, here's what parents had to say about our teachers. They said that the faculty is one of the best things about PBS. They said that they experienced the quality of teaching at PBS as being high. And they gave high praise for teachers' ability to inspire their children and to teach to different learning styles. I think those are really strong results from these surveys, students and parents. So I want you to know this. It is my absolute number one priority to retain and recruit talent. Teaching talent is everything. The board and I are committed to attractive compensation for our teachers that's among the best in our area. And in addition, I want to make sure that our faculty workplace culture is collaborative, supportive, team-oriented, built on trust. In a faculty survey we took last March, we asked them this question. Considering everything, how satisfied are you with your work at PBS? 98% of them said very satisfied or satisfied. Now that's a rating we can be very proud of here at PBS or in any workplace culture. Teachers also said this, my work gives me a personal sense of accomplishment. 98% strongly agree and agree. My colleagues and peers encourage me to be my best, 100% and I feel supported by the administration, that trickiest of questions, 93%. So I've got to find the seven. <laughs> but really, they're really strong and encouraging numbers. To have a board committed to attractive compensation and a workplace culture that feels that supportive. We're focused also on not resting on these laurels. We know that there's much more we can do. For example, we want to hire more male teachers. The problem is that only 13% of teaching candidates in early childhood and elementary education are men. But despite this, we've brought five teachers who are men on board in the last four years. We're also working really hard at building a more ethnically and racially diverse faculty. The challenge here is that only 21% of teaching candidates represent ethnic and racial diversity. But despite this, we've hired nine such teachers in the last four years. These are super important initiatives because we believe that we want our students to see themselves reflected in their teachers and the real world reflected in their teachers. Another priority that we've been working on as a school is developing our teachers as leaders really wanting our teachers to see themselves as leaders at the school. We asked our faculty about opportunities for developing themselves professionally, and 98% of them said very satisfied and satisfied. And I want you to know that our teachers are totally committed to knowing and loving your children and to continuing to hone their craft and be the best possible teachers for these students. So finally, the key ingredient of excellent program. We have a school home partnership, we have high caliber teachers, 
and then finally, an excellent program. It's intentionally child-focused. As you've heard me say on my tour talk, we start every question focused on the image of the child, putting children at the center of all of our decisions. Our program is also intentionally designed to balance that top-notch academic rigor with a strong and rigorous emotional intelligence program. I actually really want PBS to be the premier elementary school in the Bay Area. I think we're really close. I want us to be even better. We actually have a plan to do that. We have a plan to stay on top of our game, to make sure that our program is the best it can be for your children. For example, we created something called the Curriculum Deep Dive Program in 2015. We call it the CDD. It's one of a kind. I've not seen it at other schools. It is our formal, ongoing curriculum review process. We assess each curriculum area in a three-year rotation. We examine teaching practices. We study relevant research. We use outside experts to help us review our program. And then we set three-year goals to improve our program. As an example, this coming Friday, in two days, we are hosting our first ever Science Day at PBS. This initiative came directly from last June's Curriculum Deep Dive program when we studied science, a direct result coming right to the school in close proximity to making the idea happen. As you can imagine, the day's program is exciting and the students are excited and you can read about it on that PBS blog and add to those numbers I read earlier. <laughs> Another thing that we've worked very hard on here at PBS is that we've created an evidence-based way, an evidence-based method to evaluate our curriculum and measure its success. This is called our dashboard project. Sounds exciting, it actually is. My goal here is to offer real evidence rather than leaving things open to anecdote, interpretation, or assumption. Schools have dashboards for everything else. They have dashboards for finance, for enrollment, for placement, for facilities. I looked everywhere, but could not find a dashboard model for program and teaching. Strange, I thought, since schools are in the business, primarily of program and teaching. So I developed our own dashboard in partnership with the board and with my team. So PBS now has a program and teaching dashboard version 2.0. We're in 2.0 right now. It uses third-party outside assessments. It uses findings from our own internal curriculum review. It has quantitative analytics like numbers and stats. It has qualitative analytics like student surveys, parent surveys, What's behind our curriculum decision making? What are the attitudes in the community about our program? Dashboard 2.0 has 87 slides. It is reviewed by the board, and we discuss how to continue to advance, improve, and provide financial resources to continue growing the school. That's why we have a new director of emotional intelligence. It's why we have a new director of educational technology. I share dashboard results with our parents. We put things on the blog. And on Saturday, PBS trustee Alana Khan, who's here this evening, she and I are presenting a workshop on Dashboard 2.0 to a group of trustees and school heads at a conference for California independent schools in San Francisco. So one example how Dashboard 2.0 has sharpened our focus as a school is math. It's what everybody's talking about. We all know that there is new and compelling research that calls us to make changes in how we teach and learn math. And thank goodness we're not doing math like we did when we were in school. Don't you agree? It needs to be done differently. We know that from research. We have been thoughtful about implementing these changes. So we really need to assess and measure how it's going and to make all of that visible to our parents. So for example, 
Dashboard 2.0 includes a research report from a firm we hired to conduct interviews with area middle schools where PBS students are now attending to measure and assess how they're doing in middle school math. Dashboard 2.0 includes a report from UCubed at Stanford. We hired them to do an assessment over three years on how our math program is doing, and we recently hosted a film release party with Stanford professor Jo Bowler. She interviewed four PBS students in her new film about brain research and math, and she came to PBS to release the film. Dashboard 2.0 includes findings from standardized tests. Now I realize that standardized tests are not the only and not the primary way to measure curricular success, but I do think they're important. And I think that standardized tests, in tandem with our own measurements internally, offers an important view. And here's the bottom line from our dashboard. PBS students are significantly outperforming their independent school peers in math. In quantitative reasoning, 54% of PBS students achieve above average levels in math, compared to 23% for independent schools, 54 to 23. If you think about above average and average together, that's 87% of PBS students, 97%, sorry, compared to 77% in independent schools. There's another ERB called the Mathematics Test, and there, 54% of PBS students are above average in their scores, compared to 23% for independent schools. Putting above average and average together, we're at 96%, independent schools at 77%. So why do I share this? It's an example of Dashboard 2.0, but I share it more importantly for this reason. I am proud of our students. I am proud of our student mathematicians and how beautifully they perform in math in their classrooms as well as on standardized tests. They are high math achievers. I'm also sharing this because I want you to know that I am personally committed to an excellent program and to using an evidence-based method to continuing to improve, strengthen, and grow our program. And I'm sharing it with you because I promise that your children will have the best learning experience every day. And so I need to know, and my board needs to know, how we're doing. That's why I share this. So I've talked a bit tonight about school-home partnership. I've talked about high-caliber teachers. I've talked about excellent program. I've shared a bunch of data points, analytics. I've shared a bunch of my own opinions and assessments. And I've shared what I love about the school. But I want to conclude by saying just a few words about my role as head of school at PBS. I really think it's my chief responsibility to inspire our teachers so that they can inspire our students, so that our students can inspire us. That's how I see it. Because if our students inspire us, magical things happen in school. I think that if you join our community, I would like to be able to promise you this. I want to inspire you too. I want to ensure you that your children will have the best possible curriculum with the best teaching talent in the Bay Area. I will offer opportunities to partner with you, and I will provide you and your children with a strong sense of community, which I know you're looking for. So with that, I'm thrilled about your interest in PBS. Thank you very much. Now, if we're going to stay consistent with PBS parents, you have to ask really hard questions. So let's see who's first. Yes, sir. So the things I'm not focusing on? Um, I think that when I arrived at PBS um, seven and a half years ago, sorry, six and a half years ago, I'm in my seventh year, feels like longer than that. Um, I do think that there was a lot of work to be done to build the community after a bit of a rocky transition with the previous leader. 
I think there were some things about the school's reputation that we needed to improve and to co really to put together the reality with perception to close that gap. When I arrived, we needed to do a lot of work on our identity and we've conducted a rebranding process and a, and a complete overhaul of our marketing. Uh, the trend lines on admission and finance were flat and now they're increasing. And so now it's really being able to say that um, those are important elements. We want our enrollment, our admissions to be strong, our fundraising to be strong, our finances are strong, but we can now focus on those as continuing the trend line moving in the right direction so that we can focus on the things that are in here. Don't be shy, please. I've been asked a lot of questions in my career, so I'm not going to be afraid of anything. So our family retention has also been an uh, upward trend line, which is good. Last year, we had the best retention in our history. We were at 4.6% attrition, so it means we were above 95% retention of our families. Um, honestly, most of our attrition issues are involuntary, uh, parents who move out of the area. And we've even had some parents who maybe start their family here, but then a parent works in the city, and they just can't make that commute work. We've had the reverse where parents are commuting here and then move here. So if you take those involuntary moves out, it's actually a very small handful. It often has to do with uh, maybe the right match wasn't what it quite should have been when they made that initial assessment, and maybe that's something we agree with, maybe not. It may also have to do with um, realizing that if we're living in Palo Alto or these wonderful parts of the country, we have strong public schools. So it has something to do with um, the tuition dollars, in fact. Um, but we've had very little um, retention issues uh, around dissatisfaction lately, um, which I'm proud of because our parents really stick with it and work through some of the issues. But those would be the two areas I would name most. But really the top reasons are these relocation things, which is really a Silicon Valley phenomenon, I think. People get transferred um, for a variety of reasons. And that San Francisco Silicon Valley commute is not getting shorter or easier. Yes. Are there any areas where you feel PBS does not excel? And if so, what are you doing to try and improve that? Absolutely, I feel that way. So, um, you know, I suppose I'm not satisfied when there's a statistic in a survey below 90%. I do think that there was a question on the student survey that I didn't raise, but I'll tell you now, because I have it up here. Um, one question was uh, students commenting on whether or not they feel their teachers are fair. And 77% said most often or usually. And I would like that number to be higher. It's hovered in the low 80s before, and now is a little below. I actually think that um, it's really hard for students to understand what fair means. And so there's re I'm actually maybe glad if the number was low, I suppose. We would, it would not be good if the number was too high. But I think on concepts like fair, and also concepts like challenge, achievement, and competition, which I've actually been focused on this year, um, there are places where we can grow. Our students don't always understand what challenge means. They don't understand that struggle and making a mistake actually grows your brain and helps you to improve. We've all made most of our strides as human beings when we've struggled, right? But it's really hard to teach that to younger students. That's a place where I want us to grow. I think in the area of math, um, there needs to be more work done uh, in terms of parent schools understanding and coming together. I think the educators at the school um, have become very comfortable some of the, with some of the new methodologies. I think our parents are slower in some cases to become as comfortable because we were trained and taught in a very, very different way, including me. And so part of the challenge is how do we help parents um, learn more about this in a way that represents um, parent education without using educator jargon that might be confusing. And then I'll close with this. Um, I think that the stress and anxiety levels in all of our communities are 
increasing. I think that people have been stressed about things that are going on in our country, in our area, uh, shootings in schools, um, digital citizenship issues where technology has made incursions where it shouldn't have, um, fires, hurricanes, I mean, mudslides. These are just highly stressful things and they take a lot of emotional energy. And I think that that's an area where we as a school really want to build up our emotional intelligence program. And I think there are things that are on our minds for the future that we're just starting to talk about. But what I will guarantee you is this, status quo is not in our vocabulary at PBS. We are always looking for ways to improve. Yes? So the question is about what other types of parent education are offered in addition to the ones I've mentioned. I think that the best parent education happens when parents are actually in the classroom observing students. So that would be one thing um, I feel less need to focus on today. When I first arrived at PBS, that was less common. It's, I think a word we could use today is rampant. It's, it's very common to see parents in classrooms shelving books in the library, um, I know that, for example, when our science teachers send out a spreadsheet to say, come volunteer for science labs, be an extra pair of hands, and see the curriculum in action, I've heard that in two minutes it's completely filled. Um, and so I actually think that those are the ways where it happens best, is when parents are actually rolling up their sleeves and participating. Another way that I'm really excited about is there are now three parents teaching in our after-school program at PBS. One of them is here right now, Wiley Anderson. He was our pioneer right here, make things with Wiley, um, right, right? And he's also an alum of the school too, as a bonus, and now he's been joined by two of his peers. And I think that's an awesome way for parents to participate in our after-school program. Um, we've added a summer program this year. We're piloting a summer program, and I think that parents will be excited to learn some new things about their kids and their school through that summer program. So I think when parents are on campus mm -hmm. observing and watching and participating, it's an outstanding way to get parent ed across. Much better than having me or anyone else speak about it. Yes. So the question is, how do you navigate this high energy, highly engaged group versus basically taking the school's lead when appropriate? You said it's sort of like listening to me or my, the teacher. I, you know, I'm, I prefer collaboration and feedback and input. I think it's better to know what the input is than to have it in the parking lot or hidden somewhere. So I think it's actually, if there's something tough to be solved, there's a problem to deal with, I think it's better to have it out in the open so it can be dealt with. And I have rarely had difficulty when actually having a balanced, measured conversation with a PBS parent, getting to a place where we can agree on our strategy for moving forward. Um, there may be dissent. Um, there may not be 100% agreement. It may be stressful. It may make me angry or irritated. I might get an email that makes me upset. But I think if we all just could step back and increase our emotional intelligence and realize that the primary objective is that student. And if you are having difficulties conversing, if you just take it right back to that image of the student and putting the student at the center, I often think that people can back away from hard positions. So. I think over time, I mean, I think the parents here have gotten to know me and my team. I think they, by and large, trust us and like us. I think being likable is important. I mean, we want to do things for people we like, right? If we're not likable, it's not fun. So it's fun to like each other um, and to go with that rather than people you don't like to be with. 
So I think all of that, are, those are ingredients for a good dialogue. But some of the most exciting things and exciting ideas that we've implemented have been ideas from parents. And so why should we be against ideas from parents? We should be open to them. And one compliment I heard from a family last week is they believe that the feedback loop at PBS is very tight. That it's not like they have an idea and then it takes five years. It takes closer to five minutes or five days. And maybe that's Silicon Valley in part, but I also think it's how we believe about acting on things we think are good. I've also told parents that I don't think some of their ideas are good. They're, they're not that good. And so we're not gonna do them. And they've been okay with that, by and large, at least in front of me. <laughs> maybe they might say something else to someone else, but you know, I, I, I think it's great, right? So, but I think at the end of the day, when you're in the dentist chair, you want that dentist to be an expert and you want to interact with that dentist. I think the same thing happens in school. At the end of the day, you want the educators in charge of the program. And getting parents to learn and increase their understanding is the key to a collaborative environment. Yes. Thank you. We survey grades three through five. I probably should have just mentioned that for that very reason. I mean, can you imagine a first grader trying to, um, they'd ask 15 questions like, what is this, why, and you know, and that just, no. Um, so we actually do practices a lot. We are, our third through fifth graders have their own iPads. They've been familiar with iPads since preschool. Um, we, we have a intentional process to use iPads and we actually practice doing ERB standardized tests on iPads because that's really the way of the future. And so the survey is something that actually comes very naturally to them. They, um, they're accurate and they're, they have a facility with that methodology, which the train and the training happens earlier and they're prepped for that in third grade. Yes. What do we look for when we hire teachers? So how do I identify that talent? So there are many things that could seem obvious, like a beautiful lesson or um, good interaction with peers, uh, facility with the knowledge base, the content area for a kindergarten teacher or a first grade teacher, background and experience. So those things are all important. But I'll tell you what's really important to me is watching how that teacher interacts with the students. When I, I don't do much of this now because I, my, my upper school and lower school administrators do this, but when I w used to observe uh, practice classes with interviewees, I would always watch the students, not the teacher. Watch the students. And my colleagues do that. And that's how you really find the teacher who's got it. Because there's a lot of good teaching caliber and talent out there, but that bond and connection to the kids, and you can see it when it happens right away. That's the most important thing to me. I also think that you want someone, maybe a second thing, who has a collaborative growth mindset. Um, someone who's not stuck, um, but someone who's flexible. Because if you're going to be a first grade teacher, fifth grade, you've got to be flexible. So watch the students if you're visiting classes. That's the best way to know how things are going. We require a practice teaching lesson for that very reason. Yes. So, so the question is, the, you know, this thing about risk-taking, developing independence, and then creating a separation from the parents to develop right. that. And especially for the older students. For older students in particular. We approach it differently. We do. So I don't know how you think about this, but it's really interesting to watch preschool parents drop off their preschool on the first day of school. There are always tears. 
there's always a bit of anxiety. The kids usually are pretty happy, but the parents are nuts <laughs> and really worried. Because my gosh, I mean, those three years went fast, right? From this home environment, and now you're turning them over to us, and they now have peers, and it just gets more and more complicated. So that's, I would say, the beginning of a separation journey. And it's something that extends into adulthood. I have taught in college and high school. I've been a middle school administrator, and now I'm the head of this school. And I think the way we do it is we try to structure it differently and very intentionally by grade. The way that we invite parents into the preschool classroom is very different than the way it looks in first grade, third grade, and fifth grade. Very different. The way that we invite parent engagement is very different. Um, the way that we in encourage parents is very different. The way the grade coffees, you know, whether it's a third grade coffee or a fourth grade coffee, those discussions, that's where we can talk about this. I think that a real important um, point is when kids go to middle school because what you really want there is, is for them to develop their own independence and identity. And it's very hard because their brains are still developing and they're crazy. They are, they're impulsive. They do not make good decisions. They don't. They have bad judgment. I've seen it my whole career. In fact, if they have good judgment, there's something wrong. So it really, it's hard to sort of hold on and let that happen. And I worked at a boarding school. So when it, the, when the good judgment didn't happen, it was right there in my dormitory, right? So I think it's so important, but here's the main point. What you want even starting in preschool is to create an environment where your children can ask you about anything. And if you press them too hard, if you go at them too hard, if you make them feel like it's an interrogation, they'll stop talking to you. And what you really want to do and what we work on is how to ask questions. That's why we love this class blog. The class blog is so that parents can see what's going on in the classroom so you can say, hey, I saw that really interesting science experiment you did today, tell me about it. And to ask more open-ended questions without interrogation. Because you want them, as the stakes get higher and higher, and the issues in life get more and more complicated and potentially more dangerous, you want them talking to you, not to the internet. And so building that relationship with you has to start in preschool. And the separation is key. And I, right now, am very proud to say that I have an outstanding relationship with my parents. And I feel like I can talk to them about almost anything. And that feels really good um, to be able to say that. And I think that's what our goal is, starting in preschool. Yes? So the question is about the transition to middle school and that awkward sort of social transition. Again, um, I think that the transition to middle school should be awkward. It's an awkward time. And it's um, in those awkward moments that the most growing happens. <clears throat> so what I would say is by creating a safe community space where the students can talk to their teachers to learn how to build relationships with adults, with their peers. I love when students talk to me. You know, having an a, adult relationship is important. In fact, the story I'll offer is there's a graduate of our school who's in sixth grade. He happens to be living in Argentina this year for sixth grade. He has a family connection. He visited PBS two weeks ago, and I think he grew a foot since June. And he walked in the NPR here, and I sort of said hello to him as if I'd seen him yesterday, and then I realized it was actually Teo. And um, we went and had lunch together, and it was the most mature adult conversation I could imagine for a sixth grader. And he said that some of his friends thinks it's strange that he has friendships or can actually talk to adults. I told him I think that's outstanding. That's exactly what we try to do at PBS. So that these students actually ask adults and ask their parents for advice and get into a mature and maturing relationship with them so that Every topic is worth talking about, especially the hard ones. I think one of the hardest things about middle school is when students have to start balancing their own schedule and managing their own time. And so it feels like all of a sudden there's all this stuff that we had all this help with at PBS. Mm -hmm. And we had all this support. And that's because they've been here for eight years. But I think that is one of the biggest challenges we hear from our, our graduates. They feel prepared, but it's that time management balance 
that they have to do on their own. And then all, many of them start having these when they leave PBS, and so that becomes a new time management challenge of its own. I actually heard that when our graduates last year who loved each other, right, shared, they shared their cell phone numbers with each other, there were like 800 texts back and forth, like within 48 hours, and that it was mostly, hey, how's it going? Fine, good, yeah, you, like one words. <laughs> so welcome to the new world. We have time for another question or two. Don't be shy. I have one. Please. As a PBS student who's gone to middle school, what do you hope are the characteristics and or skills that someone would say about that student? So the question is, when a PBS student graduates and goes on to another school or to life, what would I like the attributes or characteristics to be? A credo of kindness? Uh, problem solver, cognitively fizzy, um, an interesting person to be with, um, ready to embrace academic challenges, um, a student who understands the concepts as well as the mechanics, so can think conceptually and solve problems. I would like to have a person who is solutions oriented, always interested in finding solutions, I'd like to have uh, team players, collaborative learners, and I'd like them to be the leaders of these schools. And the good news is we have a lot of PBS graduates who are now student council presidents at their middle schools and high schools, and I think that's outstanding. We have PBS parents who are on boards and PBS uh, or you know, parent association leaders at these schools. And I'm proud of that too, that our parents are emulating that leadership for their students. And so I think these are qualities of leadership that I would like to say that PBS students take with them from PBS. Yes? Can you talk about having it both ways, like mm -hmm. with academics and social emotional learning? Yes. Like, there moments in the process where there's a tension between the two concepts, and maybe you have a time where you worked through them, or you know, maybe in competition with each other, how you thought that's a great question. So the question about the balance of top-notch outstanding academics and a really strong emotional intelligence program, are they potentially in competition with each other and maybe not mutually supportive? So um, I would say that yes, that has been intention. And one of my key focus areas as head is to really bolster the academics of the school in my seven years as head and to make it really clear that there is no absolutely no, nothing counter between those two things. In fact, the research shows that there's the highest correlation to academic achievement is high emotional intelligence. Because if there's not good emotional intelligence in the classroom, then the academics just aren't gonna happen. So that correlation has been important. That's been a teaching opportunity for me. I think sometimes people may say, well, if you're kind, that's one of our core values, so this credo of kindness, can you also be competitive at the same time? My answer is yes. I want our students to be competitive, absolutely. But there's an appropriate kind of competition, like an internal competition, or a little healthy competition, like we did a competition for walking to school, where we went from 23 to 54 to 78 students walking to school with me um, in a three week period for a free dress day. That was healthy competition. It was good competition. Or that um, maybe if you have love of learning, is learn should learning be so challenging? I say yes. And the reason why I don't see uh, a problem or opposition between academics and emotional intelligence is because my own experience as an educator and as a human being doesn't bear that out. I would like to say that my academic intelligence has not meant that I'm unkind by and large. And I would like to say that about our students too. So I think that very um, premise has been something I've worked to diminish and teach how they can actually be supportive and mutually um, complementary 
of each other because I think it's actually true and I want our students to be, in, to be competitive and to achieve and to be challenged. I want that. So I gave talks at the beginning of the school year on those three topics and I'm really trying to initiate a longer dialogue in the school about that. So aside from the general awkward transitions that can happen, like time management and other things, social dynamics, um, a couple things is ha may have one around math might be around acuity with mechanics, mathematical mechanics, and kind of having quick ability to recall some of those mechanics using them in algebra. That would be one area. A second area might be writing mechanics around just sort of the grammatical things. Um, the, the reason why those are interesting and important things to think about is I want to be really careful that we don't just assume that teaching a memorization of grammar or mathematical mechanics automatically leads to greater recall. Because I taught writing at a really good boarding school for 11th graders, and they still needed work on where commas were supposed to go. And a lot of the research, even when I was a teacher, was that if you memorize that, you'll forget it. You have to really practice it. And so you have to think about the concepts of being a poet or a short story writer or a mathematician just as much as a mechanics uh, person. Those would be the two areas where we're working on bolstering. And one of the ways we're doing that is we're, this spring, going to be working on interviewing nine middle schools where our graduates most attend, where 80% of our graduates go and really make sure, again, that we're aligned with the syllabus so that the syllabus transition from PBS to the next school is smooth, and then interview those educators about just those questions. Because we want to make sure that we're doing the right things and not making assumptions about what they're expecting. The second thing I would say about that that just gives me slight caution is I was a middle school director. The greatest challenge intellectually for middle school students is algebra, full stop, algebra. It is very difficult for middle schoolers. It's just so out of the range of where their brains are. It requires such new ways of thinking about math. And so one of the things I'm proud of here is we're working on that particular conceptual framework for math that I think will help over time smooth that transition a little bit more too. Thank you. Maybe time for one more question if you have it, so we don't end the evening on algebra. <laughs> <clears throat> yes? That's fine. Yes, 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 and yes. We have a, so when I got to this school, and we've just improved this since, we had really excellent uh, protocols in place. We have an emergency preparedness manual, manual. We review it annually. We update it annually. We send it for third-party review annually. And our drills are actually above what were required by the Menlo Park Fire Department. That includes lockdown drills earthquake drills and fire drills. We do unannounced drills as well as announced drills so that we can get the kids to practice at what to do during, the, during a real actual emergency. So we have, I think, really good protocols uh, in those areas. Around safety, um, we are an open campus, as, as you see. Uh, we're in a relatively safe neighborhood. I think having a neighbor as a public school next door is helpful and everything else are people, neighbors who've been here, many of them for decades. Um, I think the best security protocol, and actually this is proved out by third party research, is that the best security measure is on-site recognition. 
knowing exactly who belongs and who doesn't belong. So I'm sorry if you visit a campus and someone has asked you if you belong here or who you are. We do that purposefully. And our front desk personnel who are right there know everybody. And you are not allowed to take a student from the school without a signed form from the parent. So the parent has to say, these three people, grandma, grandpa, and I, are allowed to take the student from the school. Otherwise, it does not happen. And those messages flow very, very uh, quickly and directly to the teachers as well. So around these areas, I feel really strong about how we're doing. And I think the area we just want to consider and keep thinking about is how we make sure the perimeter and our nighttime security measures are, are well thought through. You know, for example, our facilities manager's here really early and he checks all the bathrooms first thing in the morning so that we don't get surprised by someone who might be, might be in there. Everything's locked, but it's, a, it's a, a direct measure. So the adults are the first people into all the spaces at the school. So thank you for asking. And we did have one question over here, which I will answer before 7 o'clock. Okay, so just really quickly, how do you evaluate the kids? Like, what do the progress reports look Progress reports, thank you for using that phrase. We call them progress reports. Um, report cards would be another way to, to call them. So there's, we, we've been working on progress reports since I arrived. It's now, I think, version 3.0 since I've been here. So it's, it's had uh, a lot of review. Faculty drive that process. Um, faculty are in charge of really elevating how we look at progress reports. There's a quantitative section and a qualitative section. The quantitative section has a series of standards or benchmarks where we think a second grader should be six months in or at the end of the year. And then the teachers are evaluating on a bar graph basically about where those students are. And it's not rated with a grade. The top level is that a student can do something independently. Because what we know is that when a student can do something independently, that student has acquired and knows that concept. So that's kind of the quantitative. And then there's a narrative, a narrative report from the teachers commenting on how the student is doing. And we release progress reports twice a year. January followed the following week by conferences with parents and teachers. And again in early June, followed by the closing parent-teacher conference of the year. So obviously, we're here for you. We want to be able to answer all of your questions. We know this is a quiet time between submitting an application and waiting for the school to get back to you. But in the meantime, if there's a part of your process you need to complete with Mita and Michelle, please reach out to them. If there are questions you'd like to ask further, please reach out to us. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to make sure you know all that you can about PBS. Obviously, we love our school. We know it's not perfect, but this is a group of people really committed to constant improvement and making it the best possible school it can be. So thanks again for looking at our school, and thank you for a great evening. Have a great time, and see you later.